Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, in this modern age, technology can be both our best friend and our worst enemy all at the same time. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more, as always. My name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals. We pick their brain about current projects, state of the injury, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and a conversational fashion. And you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do. Uh, you can listen right now. You can listen. Subscribe. Hit that like button. Give us the old subscribe. Uh, basically, wherever you get your podcasts, we're available over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, pretty much everywhere. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our NC YouTube channel. So you can give us a like and subscribe as well. We would really appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We are on the TikTok, and we are on the Letterboxd for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large, because, you know, if we love to write about it and talk about it, and we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a good one. Uh, we've been, uh, well, we've been on a bit of a hiatus unintentionally for a little bit. Uh, we apologize for that. You know, it happens, life happens. But what we've got for you today is, uh, we're talking about Missing. It is in theaters now. It is a hell of a thriller that, uh, basically, I don't want to say too much about it, but it's about the story of a, a young woman whose mother's, mother goes missing, and then she tries to find her from home using the tools available to her. And uh, it's really an interesting commentary on sort of the pros and also the cons of technology in so many other ways. It's in the same vein as uh, Searching, which you may remember from a couple of years back. But uh, I think this one's better. I really like this one. I think this definitely improves on the formula. And uh, we had the unique pleasure of sitting down with the writers and directors of the film, uh, Mr. Nicholas D. Johnson and Will Merrick, and just asking them both about sort of the origins of the story and sort of the places they took it, and so very much more. I mean, we had a fun cock with them, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. But uh, before you listen, make sure you go see uh, Missing, which is in theaters now, but enjoy our talk with Nicholas and Will, because as always, it's a darn good one. Will, Nick, obviously, first off, just thank you so much for the time today, guys, and congratulations on the film, man. It's a hell of a ride. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Great thank you so you. much for having us. No, I mean, Will, I guess, uh, walk me through sort of the origin of this, because I've got to imagine it was birthed from, like, both of your experiences on Searching. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, Searching came out in 2018, and, and you know, it was made on a tiny budget with a tiny group of people, and it did way better than any of us ever could have expected. And, uh, and, and when we learned there was actually interest in making a sequel, um, uh, I think basically what happened is uh, Sev Ahanian and Anish Chaganti, uh, who wrote and then respectively produced and directed the first movie, came to us and, and with an outline, a little bullet-pointed treatment, and said, would you guys want to write uh, and develop this into uh, a sequel, follow-up, turned into kind of like an, an installment, a next, like, yeah. And... Uh, we kind of got going from there. We felt like there was some stuff we left on the table visually and narratively from, from the first one that we could come and, you know, knock out this time. For sure. Now, I mean, Nick, I'm always curious on something like this. I've got to imagine uh, pre-visualization and even storyboards have to be pay, play a big part in making something like this because when you've got multiple frames of action inside another frame i can imagine it's easy even for you guys to get lost as you're putting it together yeah i think it's it's difficult both for us to you know visualize potentially but also more importantly it's difficult to communicate to actors and to crew what exactly it is that we're shooting i think the script did a pretty good job communicating that but we definitely needed a visual aid so that's yeah that's very um uh, yeah, you're correct. We actually spent 27 weeks uh, editing, like literally editing an entirely, like the entire movie with music and, and terrible acting of just me and Will doing all the voices um, so that we could literally sit down and we actually even screened it for some friends, like really close friends to get notes on. So 
we actually um, used that both as a way of doing a final rewrite of the movie before we sent it out to actors uh, and ultimately shot it, but also as a, as a roadmap. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, a, it's also a logistical issue of like, where is June's eyes supposed to be? You know, uh, how, what is the pacing of this live action scene supposed to be? Like, um, so by, pre by previsiting it, we, um, we, had, we gave ourselves like a really nice roadmap um, that we could take into production. No, I mean, Will, I've got to imagine that both your experience as editors definitely played a big part in, in making this film. I mean, just from hearing you describe that, it like you don't hear many stories about films being edited first before the actors get <laughs> <been> inserted. <laughs> that probably has something to do with us getting the job, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I've got to ask about casting because I mean, Storm is absolutely fantastic. I mean, how did Nate, how did you guys ultimately find Storm and decide that, that she was going to be sort of the heroine of this story? Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think searching is carried by John Cho, and we knew that um, that in doing this, we needed someone yeah. equally uh, like who who is able to who's a movie star who can carry a movie. Uh, on her own, and um, we had a script that featured a young actress. So we were like, how do, how "Does this person exist?" Um, and we were lucky enough to have, you know, to have seen Storm and Invisible Man, and um, talked with her, and she had mutual interest. And yeah, we're lucky to have her. Well, for sure. And I mean, as, uh, along the lines of casting as well, there's someone else in the film that I absolutely love to see. Like, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big fan of Joaquin. And I mean, obviously, seeing him in the film as a, as a, as a fan of film, I was expecting him to be one thing, but he ended up being kind of something else. Like, walk me through sort of like sort of engineering that little switch for audiences. <laughs> he, I mean, from the very beginning, Javi was a favorite character of everyone, us included, and um, and and I, I don't know something about Joaquin. We we just decided. I think you know we like the idea that he you know he's played so many bad guys, and then. We take him and put a little like task rabbit thing on his back and put him on this like motorcycle. <laughs> he was like, "What are you doing to Joaquin Almeida?" <laughs> and we were like, "You're gonna love it. I hope he does." Uh, he was amazing to work with. Such a cool dude. Really great. Honestly, one of my favorite like human beings that I've ever met. Uh, he, he also just as like um, as someone as an actor, like Will and I both really admire like the craft of acting and. Uh, to see someone with that experience uh, who also in between takes would just sit and look at his lines. He takes it so seriously and he puts so much into every role that he that he has and he has so much joy in working. He just loves working that uh, it's really inspiring to work with someone like that and it's truly a gift, like truly an honor for our first feature to work with someone of that caliber. Awesome. No, I mean, something else about this film I really enjoyed is the fact that, I mean, and we had similar themes in searching as well, that, I mean, obviously, internet technology can be a scary thing, but if you know how to use it, it can also be a pretty amazing thing. How important was it for you guys to have this story to sort of give both messages? Yeah, our goal is, I mean, it's great that it has both messages. Our goal is sort of to try to tune that out as much as possible, to be honest, and just tell a story and, uh, you know, not be the moral arbiters of it ourselves, but let you watch right. and decide. And I love the conclusion you just said. No, I mean, I got to ask, as, as first-time filmmakers, I mean, is there anything in the process that you guys learned about it all that maybe you didn't expect? I mean, absolutely. Every day we uh, was a humbling experience. I mean, you're constantly being confronted with. We did a lot of preparation, and we would previs the entire movie. You would, you know, and we knew the material really well. But no matter how well you prep, there's always something that happens, and it, and it's constant. And I think directing is really about not necessarily preparing for every single possible thing and anticipating every possible thing, but just knowing the material well enough and being on the same page well enough that you can trust your instincts in the moment you'll you'll solve that yeah. issue, whatever that issue will arise, because an issue will arise. I was to say just communication is always harder than you think it's gonna be, and tropes have their own weight. There's yes. kind of this automatic momentum a project has toward the cheesiest possible version of itself <laughs> that you have to always be just really actively communicating against. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was really interesting to see that happen. 
I mean, do you think that communication, that prep work, that helped you guys to maintain a certain degree of, I guess, surprise? Because, I mean, in watching the film, there are some genuine surprises as it all unfolds. I would say that has that that is more about that that's like uh, less about the execution and more just about the script we went in with, which you know from the very treatment that Seven and Niche gave us was like ha- had all those surprises. I remember feeling mm-hmm. when I read it for the first time, their treatment feeling the same way you probably feel watching the movie. And I think a lot of it is just being aware that like we've seen all these mystery movies, we love movies, and and audiences have seen all those same movies. We're, we know all the tropes, um, so we, we, we love that stuff, and we like intentionally playing against uh, tropes and also playing against what we think are, are just inherent biases that people have. Um, it's just a, a fun little give and take that you have with the audience. Now, I'm curious, how would you guys as storytellers define what genre this sits in? Because, I mean, in watching it, it definitely felt like it's straddling a few different lines. I think we and our whole team, I think, are big fans of the just classic thriller. There's so much, there's a lot of horror, which we also love. There's a lot of drama, which we also love. But I think we just are like, what about a, a thriller, man? It's just cool. You're on the edge of your seat. Yeah, yeah but you're, you're right. I think tonally, Searching and Missing are, are somewhat unique in the sense that they have some comedy to them, but they also feel really grounded and there are elements of horror um, but I think more than anything, we we love like Vertigo. We love classic Hitchcock, Spielbergian sort of sort of movies, and that's probably the stuff we have in mind. It's just fun popcorn thrillers. I love that. I love that. And I, I mean, I'm kind of curious because just of the nature of the setup of these films, there is a certain degree of disconnect. But I mean, I've got to imagine how do you guys direct? Like, are you on set or like, can you almost literally do this all on Zoom? <laughs> You can't do it all on Zoom. <laughs> I mean, you could, okay, but, but you wouldn't end up with you wouldn't end up with quite this result. <laughs> yeah, no. It, it, uh, some people sometimes thought like, oh, it's the perfect pandemic movie. Like, you guys can just do it all remote. But um, there's actually physical production. Uh, some of our crew who have way more experience than we did said this was one of the most challenging um, shoots they'd ever been on. Um, just people to give you an a example, lot a lot of experience. Yeah. And that's because um, it, it's really challenging to shoot and block an entire scene. We were shooting, in some cases, eight pages a day um, with no coverage, right? So everything's in a wide, and everyone's looking at the monitor thinking, what the hell is this? And it's a different aspect ratio, every shot, yeah. depending on and, what and app. And you're trying to explain, no, we're going to be punching in here. And, and so we are projecting coverage that the crew can't see. And so, and you're checking all these beats off that you need constantly. So it's a uh, mentally taxing, really mentally taxing for the actors, I think, mm-hmm. as well. Who, um, in addition to physical blocking, also have eyeline blocking and a lot to remember. In addition to just being emotionally available. So I mean, I guess that dovetails into the next question. Like, how do you guys, as first-time filmmakers, kind of engender that trust not only in your cast and your crew when you have a coverage mm-hmm. shot in mind that doesn't necessarily exist yet? I mean, I feel like uh, Natalie, Anish, and Sev are are getting to this point where there's a lot of trust in them, and they did a great job of sort of endorsing us in front of everybody, like, trust this person (laughs) to us. Um, And, uh, I I mean, otherwise, I think, think, you know, there's no no hiding bad preparation if you don't do it, And, and in another way, if you do do preparation, everybody can tell. I think it was clear that we had had done the work and we knew what the scenes were about. We any question that was asked, we knew the answer to, and and I think that eventually stacks up to something. Going forward for you guys, how do you think sort of the ingrained nature of preparation that I can tell you guys have w- will serve you on different projects? Because when I watch this, like you said, the preparation is obvious, and that's why it works. Because there is so many, there are so many moving pieces. Like, how do you think an experience like this will help you on something maybe a little more traditional without sort of the the screen and screen kind of dynamic? I think even though we will will never probably previs a movie to this extent, we'll always be storyboarding um, everything that we do. I think this is also something that we learned a lot from a niche is like make excessive amounts of Google Sheets and Google Docs to share with your uh, with your department heads. Um, I think like it's all about that communication because because it, it if you just rely on the script or like Will said um, just like just uh, tropes you're gonna end up with something that just doesn't feel real or, or feels like just 
I don't know. Something gets lost in communication. So, because yeah. uh, other people who aren't in our in our position of being able to like survey the whole thing, like uh, are you know you're put in this position where if you're not communicated too clearly what's expected of you, you just have to have everything the safest version of it ready. And that's that's not you doing your job wrong. That's you doing your job right. You just weren't communicated to. And so I, I think it'll help create more unique stuff and help maximize budgets, all that jazz. For sure. Now, I mean, just to put a bow on this, I mean, I think like you guys said, this is very much a classic sort of popcorn thriller. But at least to me, in my eyes, it pushes it, it like pushes those rules, like the boundary rules a little bit and allows you to sort of bend it with it and sort of make something very unique. And I'm, like if you guys had to talk to someone else, like how would you compare a film like Missing to say something more old school, like you, like you guys mentioned, like a Vertigo, because mm. there are some similarities, but again, it's it's films that kind of push the expectation of what this kind of movie is going to be. Good question. I yeah, I I've definitely spent some time trying to think of something else that would be as much of a blast of innovation as this and searching were, and I so far have come up dry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think um, like Hitchcock played. Uh, with this, you know, uh, filmmakers have been doing this for, for forever, adding some strict limitation. There was a movie called Buried, you know, uh, that came out, yeah. I think, 10 years ago. Right. So all we're really doing is we're, we're using the, the, the normal language of cinema, you know, montage and, and shot reverse, and we're using all of these, all the, and even just tropes, cinematic tropes, and we're just giving ourselves a very severe limitation and out of that comes something really unique and exciting and and technologically innovative but um i do think that that's something that's just been going on for forever it's really fun to play with a limitation um and yeah. find something unique yeah well said well i think you guys have done that in this time i think this is a film that, that much like the first one is going to stand out on its own and i think a, a generation of audiences are really going to embrace it going forward man but again to both of you, just congrats on the work and thank you so much for the time today. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.